Hi there. Have a look at this table on the left. So in this table, in each row, you can see the following things. The name of a wrestler, the number of times that wrestler has been a champion, and the combined number of days where that wrestler has been a champion, or like the sum of the length of all their championships along with the column that is the rank, and this is ranked by the combined days attribute. So this table is very interesting by itself, but if you look at the right, we have a couple of questions, and let's try to answer them. Which wrestler had the most number of reigns? So for that, you need to go to number of reigns column, right? and you need to mentally sort them, and you'll find out that eight is the highest number, and therefore, Ric Flair is the uh, wrestler you're looking for. Second question, the average time as a champion for top two wrestlers. Now we need to go the top two wrestlers. We can guess that pertains to the rank. And then, so we want the average of these two numbers. Um, you even have questions such as, which of the following wrestlers were ranked were ranked in the bottom three, which the answers would be all of those. And then after that, out of these, who had more than one reign? And you can see that's Dan Severn. So the paper that we're having here is trying to answer questions like this if given a table. As you can see, this is a pretty, pretty hard task. <laughs> and um, so pretty excited to read this. The paper is called Tapas, Weekly Supervised Table Parsing via Pre-Training by Jonathan Herzig, Pavel Christoph Novak, Thomas Miller, Francesco Piccino, and Julian Martin Eisenschloss. Uh, full disclaimer, I know these people, so I might, might be slightly biased. All right, so you've already seen the task. The task is you are given a table and a question and you're trying to answer that. Now, there, it, it's, not, it's not as easy as that, but the table questions come in different forms, as you have seen. Sometimes you just need to select a cell from a table, like we have here. The first question, um, I simply, most number of reigns, I simply select whatever that is. So the answer here is already in the table, Ric Flair. And this they call a cell selection task. This is wherever you need to select a cell. The same for these bottom here. So which of the following wrestlers were ranked in the bottom three and out of these, which one of more than one reign? All of these answers are in the table somewhere. The second thing is what they call a scalar answer. That is when the answer to be computed is a number that is not in the table. So these average time here, which turns out to be 3,426, is nowhere to be found in the table. So there actually needs to be a computation performed by the model. And lastly, you have these things called ambiguous answers. Uh, now, the ambiguous answers refer to a thing where it is a number that you're looking for, so how many, but the number here is in the table. So you can think of this in terms of training data. If you have a task like this and you have training data and you just have the question, you just have this question and you're given the answer to, right? You can teach your model either to select this number here, or you can teach your model um, that would be wrong, right? Because how many world champions are there with only one reign? To simply select this cell here is not correct, because that cell, even though the number is two, it doesn't mean the same thing. It's not counting, right? So the correct program here would be to count uh, the number to count the cells where there is a one here, which is also two. And they call this situation ambiguous answer. So you might have already guessed that a single model that does all of this needs to sort of have multiple modes. Um, that's exactly what they propose. So they propose a model 
that takes in the table and the question. And then in the first step, it selects its mode. So the mode is either the cell selection or it is to compute something. And then whenever it's a cell selection, it simply has a component to select cells. But when it's a compute, um, it needs to decide in the second step what to compute and then also select the appropriate cells. So So this is the model. Now this stuff like this has existed for a long time in these table answering things, but the way we want to do it here is end to end with a single deep learning model, of course, <laughs> because we want to be better than anything else. And the trend in deep learning is to put more and more into one model and to have it end to end differentiable. All right, so you see we need multiple components, right? We need some sort of a mode selector. We need some sort of a cell collector. And we need a thing that decides if we are in the compute mode, what computation to be done. Now, let me present the model that this paper proposes. So this paper proposes to embed the question here. So you can see here, that's the question into a BERT input. So this is a, a transformer right here. This is BERT or any variant of BERT that you can think of. So the question is embedded as natural language. And then interestingly enough, the table right here is also embedded as language. We'll get to that in a second. But the question and the table are in the input. And then the model is asked to do two things. First of all, it's asked to do an aggregation prediction. So this can either be one of these programs called count, sum, average, or it can be, as you can see here, none. So no aggregation. So this handles our first two components. It can decide to perform a calculation or none. And if it is performing a calculation, it can decide to do a count, a sum, or an average. Now, the, of course, the, the model here is not limited to those computations. Um, you can think of extending this to any further computation. The important thing is that they have a number as an output. Second of all, there is a cell selector. So depending on this aggregation prediction, um, you need some cells. Like if you want to compute an average, you need uh, the cells to compute an average over. So the cell selector here uh, will select cells from the table. It's specifically, it goes by row and column, sorry, column and row. Since these tables, usually they have a header, right? This is the table header. Uh, where the attributes are listed, it makes sense to first, in a first step, select which column you want to select from. And then if once you have a column, let's say this column here, in the second step, you say which of the cells you want to select. Now these can be multiple, but the way the system is set up, it's first a column selector, and then a cell selector within that column. So you can only ever get columns from the same cell in this thing. Uh, let's remember that for later. All right, so this is what the model does. Now let's look at the input. The input to the model is this here. Now this, if you refer from this before, this was in this blue box and then here you'd have the computation selection and here you have the cell selection, right? So this is, this is how you can relate that. So usually if you input something into a transformer, what you wanna do is you want to embed this into, into a token embeddings. So first you want to split everything you put in into what are called tokens. Now, tokens are either things like words or word pieces. Um, the important thing is that you have a dictionary for it and each one gets mapped to a 
um, to a vector. So this here is your query. You take your query as a string and you tokenize it and you get the embeddings from the embedding table and that's your input, right? So it's a sequence of token embeddings. And then you also embed the table. And this I find uh, pretty cool here in this model and somewhat special is that the table is actually presented as just natural language. So <laughs> you can see here the table is one string. It's just a single string that goes from left to right. It's just the serialized table. So this table right here, you can see these are word pieces. So this table, if I reconstruct it, if I can attempt to reconstruct it, um, it is going to be a table that has as the headers, call one, call two, these are the names. So in, in our days before here would be name of the wrestler. And this would be a uh, number of days. Right. And um, then here, zero, one, two, three. So this, this table right here corresponds to this string right here. I hope you can you can make sense of that. So the table is just put there as one long string. <laughs> and then in order to make the model realize, you know, what the table is, you have these special embeddings. So usually in BERT you have what they're called position embeddings to indicate uh, where in the sequence that is. So in a simpler in the simplest case these are embeddings for the numbers 0 1 2 3 4 and so on so wherever the position is um, this you can all look up in the attention is all you need video i've made that if you are unfamiliar with transformer inputs then also the the segment embeddings simply indicate um, where what a token is part of so for every token that's part of the query, you see you have segment zero embedding. And for every token that's part of the table, you have a segment one embedding. This is simply to tell the model, hey, this particular token is part of the question or part of the table. Then you have the new things. So this paper newly introduces the following embeddings, column and row embeddings. Now these, uh, for the question, of course, they don't make any sense, but you have to put something here. So you just put column zero. But <laughs> um, for the table, you see there is a column one and column two. And the this exactly, so we've seen that this here is the header of column one, and this is the header of column two. And then it goes back column one, column two, column one, column two. And you can see here this zero is in column one and this one is in column two and this in column one again and the same for the rows so you have row zero for the headers and then row one for the first two numbers and row two for the second two numbers so this is all of this so you see these two are in the first row and these two are in the second row. All of this is to tell the model, all of this information down here is to tell the model um, how this table looks. So if it wants to select the second column from the third row, it would look in this information to see which cell to select. And then the last thing they introduce is this so-called rank embeddings. Now, as we've seen before, if this first column here is maybe the, sorry, the number of days of something, so this is the number of days, and this second one is the number of reigns, so how many championships, um, the table can only be sorted at maximum by one of them. So you want to sort of, for each cell, you want to tell the model Let's extend that table by two numbers, four and one. So for each column, 
you want to tell the model the ranking of the numbers. So here it's pretty easy. This is rank one, this is rank two, this is rank three. But on the left side, this is rank one, this is rank two down here, and this is rank three. So the model has an, will have an, if you give this information, the model will have an easier time to um, detect, like, give me the top two or something like this. Give me the worst, give me the best, give me the highest, and so on. Um, the model will have an easier time doing that. So that's why the rank here, as you can see, the zero and as also the number one are embedded rank one and the other two rank two because they're just lower. Now, I don't feel, I feel they could, could have given a better example than this table. I feel you could actually put real names here to make clearer. Um, not call one and call two. And I feel you could give a somewhat smarter content because if you just look at the picture here, you cannot see the correspondence of these rank tokens because in essence, they are exactly equal as the row tokens. But fortunately we can read the text. Oh, there's the table, ha. <laughs> So I have actually, I've not seen that, but I've discerned it correctly for this particular, um, for this particular input. All right. I think that's the, the half of the magic is how you encode the input in such a thing. And this seems to be, first of all, a pretty cool idea. But second of all, um, it exactly is what this kind of new regime of NLP is about, is that you basically put everything as a string, you annotate it in a smart way, and that lets the model figure out a lot of stuff about the input. Uh, people used to, people used to do the very different things. So people, if given a query and a table like this, what people would do is they would somehow, first of all, get the table headers and, and kind of guess the data types uh, of the attributes, and then they would formulate, reformulate the query, maybe also with a neural network, maybe with something else, into something like SQL in order to actually have an SQL statement to select the correct cells or perform the correct aggregations. And that is somewhat brittle, and um, it's just much less deep learning than this model. So I like this part of the model. Now, the problem, of course, is, as we've seen in this multi-step uh, process. So how do we, first of all, if we, build, if we want to build a cell selector, that's pretty easy, right? We've seen this. So we, the cell selector is first column, column selection, and then second uh, row selection. And this can be multiple rows. So that's fairly easy selecting cells either for just returning or for um, aggregation, pretty easy. But how do we do the, actually the aggregation selection is also pretty easy because we can just do a multi-class uh, classifier, right? So the classifier will simply tell us, a, give, give us a distribution and then we see, okay, the sum aggregation is probably here, the, the, what the model wants. The real question is how do we train this? <laughs> And how this is trained is what I find really interesting. So as we've seen, they have training data. The training data comes in the form of tables, questions, and answers. As we've seen before, uh, we don't know how to get to those answers. So when the question is, um, which wrestler had the most number of reigns, we just know the answer is Ric Flair. Now they, they do Again, a two-step process for their training data that mimics the two-step process of the model. So the first step is, is the answer a number? Is the answer a number? If no, um, then it is definitely a cell selection task. So they, if it's not a number, they just restrict themselves to selecting cells. If the answer is not in the table, 
then that just means that the correct thing is to select no cells and just say I can't answer this question. If it is a number, then again you have two options. So is it in the table? If yes, um, we are in a weird situation. If no, not in table, then it is an aggregation. Right. So if it is a number that is not in the table, that means that the answer is a number that is not in the table. That means the answer must be computed via one of these aggregations. And if the answer is a number but is in the table, then we are in this ambiguous answer setting where the it could be that we need to select the cell, but it could also be that the same number by accident uh, is in the table but actually needs to be computed from other numbers. And they do this in the most deep learning way possible, <laughs> is that they do basically a soft, um, soft decision here. So they m let the model, when they um, let it select what to compute, they let it make a soft decision. And what do I mean by that? So let's say you have these three operations, count, sum, and average. And you have the cell selection. So the cell selector will basically tell you, I will select three cells. The three cells contain the number seven, the number eight, and the number three. All right, so, and the question was, I don't even know what the question was, but the cell selector tells you these three cells are to be selected. You do this by simply selecting the cells where the cell selector has a higher probability than one half. Now, your, your aggregation selection module gives you a softmax distribution over, over the um, actions. So it's not very much count here, maybe that's 0 0.1. This here is maybe 0 0.3, and this is the 0 0.6. What you do is you simply compute all of them. So you want to compute the count here, which is 3. You want to compute the sum here, which is 18. And then you want to compute the average, which oh is 6. Ha! <laughs> I made a good example by accident. And then you simply weigh the outputs here by their probabilities. So you say, since the model wants uh, 0.1, puts 0.1 probability on the count, I'm going to um, have 0 0.1 times 3, plus it wants 0.3 times this, so 0 0.3 times 18, plus 0 0.6 times 6. Now, I'm not gonna so this is 6 plus 0.3 plus 3.6, um, 9.9. <laughs> so that, that's how the model computes things. It simply puts probability on these operations here, and then you simply take a weighted output with respect to the computation of all those things. Now, I'm pretty sure that's completely invalid because for the same numbers, for example, the sum is going to have a much larger like, variance than the average. And, um, and, and that's somewhat going... The count may be somewhere in between, depending on the numbers. So this, just to take the weighted average here, and then, <laughs> of course, right, so what they do is they do have this, this is the model output, and you have the correct answer. Let's say the correct answer was actually, was to compute the, the average, so the correct answer is six. So what they do is simply, they take the squared error, and that's their loss. Actually, they don't take the squared error, they take a approximation to the squared error, which is square until some delta, and then it's uh, linear. And this is simply to, um, be a bit more outlier robust. And they, they do other things to be more outlier robust. But this, so this is the model output, and this is the correct answer. And 
they simply count on the fact here <laughs> that this will this will back propagate so if you um want to make these two things closer if you're the model right you have the option of simply putting more weight from the from the other ones onto the average operation and that will decrease the 9.9 .9 because you as you can see um, both of these numbers will get smaller and um, no wait this isn't the yes sorry so you will you will decrease these numbers so this is the output we got from the weighted average right so if we decrease these weights you will put weight from here to here that will bring the number 9.9 .9 down and that will get you closer to the l answer you're looking for but you can also achieve this by um, you can achieve this even more right so this 9.9 .9 is too high if we want to bring the 9.9 .9 down we're much better off by taking some of that output and actually putting on this here because 3 is the lowest number right um, the only agreement here is that we want to take weight away from the 18 from the large one so I'm extremely <laughs> surprised that this works uh, given that it is so super ambiguous what the model should do um, with these operations and I I highly doubt that you can extend this set so it's of course agnostic of what these aggregations are but the to be able to extend this to many more aggregations is will I think lead to much more of these situations where the model is entirely unsure of where to put the mass of where to put the weight and I would be in interested to see what happens if you have a data set with like 20 or 50 of these aggregations and not just three um, so this is the this is the let's say the the interesting part here the other if you go the other way when you have this cell selection task it is just to select a cell right and then you simply um, have the cell selector that part here that does the selection that you also tr you train every time simply to give each cell a weight right so this this is simply the softmax over column and then the softmax over rows and you can train that um, using the cross entropy now training this cell selector from data is pretty easy when it's a cell selection task right because the answer is in the table and um, or is not in the table and then you know to select no cell so you do have the training data that a particular cell is the correct cell and you can train the model to select that cell but <laughs> it is actually a pretty hard task if it is for example you're looking for an average operation because not only do you are you not really sure that it's an average operation you just know that that kind of gives you the correct answer you also <laughs> don't really know which cells to select um, for this average operation right because depending on which cells you select and of course that's going to be a soft selection as well uh, the the average answer um, the average will be different depending on which cells you select so they're basically counting on this loss here to back propagate not only through the the selection of the aggregation to perform but also to the cell selector to set which cells to um, to select so from this weak signal it's almost like the reinforcement learning problem where you have the weak signal and you have like a billion ways to get your number closer to that signal and uh, not not really <laughs> uh, accurate understanding of what you need to do is so you're just relying on the model through lots and lots and lots and lots of data to kind of figure out which natural language questions to map to which um, cell selection and aggregation so this is it's a, it seems like impossible but it, it works <laughs> um, the last thing we need to talk about is this ambiguous uh, answer setting and as you can imagine it's pretty simple that they also let the model do an, um, a soft selection between the cell selection task so no aggregation and the 
aggregations to be performed and basically let the model figure out itself uh, which one is better um, to do an aggregation or to do no aggregation. Um, suffice to say this this only works uh, for pretty I, th I think it only works for pretty limited amount of tasks pretty limited amount of questions and you might have spotted there are even these questions that are follow-up questions which are another thing they build into the model and I don't I'm not really gonna talk about this but uh, they do have this concept as well which I find maybe a bit out of place but maybe it's just part of their data set somewhere uh, maybe it's just um, these companies want to get into this conversational mode so everything needs to be context dependent uh, the interesting part here is really the computation of the aggregates and specifically the question of which of these aggregations to choose and this <laughs> again this is so surprising that it works and uh, fairly fairly cool I think that is the gist of the paper they do extremely thorough evaluations here on these data sets and ablations to see what really counts and what doesn't um, I don't really want to go into that safe to say their results are better than anything else before uh, I believe they I believe they're actually on par with another model uh, but in one data set but they beat them on every other data set so that's you know that's cool um i don't think there was a bar diagram. never mind i invite you to check out this paper uh, look for yourself they have the code online if you want to train a model like this yourself other than that thanks for listening if you like this content please subscribe like comment tell a friend and bye bye